Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Event Industry News Podcast with me, James Dixon. And on today's episode, we welcome Dan Mason, Managing Director, and Andy Sexton, Creative Director from 2LK. 2LK, an agency that has been in business this year for 25 years, a considerable amount of time in any industry, but in such a fast-moving industry as events industry and working in the manner that they do, that is a significant achievement. So, first of all, congratulations, guys, and uh, welcome to the show today. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, Dan, for anybody who hasn't come across 2LK before in the events industry, um, give us a, a little bit uh, of an overview of what you guys do. So, a big question, and, and I think the best way to describe that is our agency credentials as uh, experiential. We're a brand experiential agency, uh, and as that's moved, moved across over the many years, it's developed from uh, exhibitions, um, conference stuff, um, creative brand experiences really, that kind of sums up what we're doing in the 25 years we've been in business. Mm. And, and really, I'm just, just thinking, it, it, brands have been around for a long time, you know, advertising and marketing of big brands is, is, is big business has been around for, you know, 100 or so years now. But um, in terms of delivering brand events and these sort of terms like experiential, things that have become synonymous and we're really used to talking about in the industry, was that quite as it is now when you started in business 25 years ago? Things have changed. A lot of things have changed. And a lot of things have stayed actually fundamentally the same. The things that we found more importantly have stayed the same are um, people and visitors coming to these to these events. We don't think that the event industry and the exhibition industry has dropped in any way. In fact, um, our business is quite the, the example of that. Um, we're very busy working on those all the time. So I don't think it's changed the fundamentals of people visiting things. I think they will always be there looking to get a, an experience of what a brand means to them and the values and the emotional connection with those brands. But technology's changed, of course. Uh, the way that we're interacting and engaging with those visitors and helping our clients do that has massively changed. And that's something we've, we've really been interested in seeing such a difference between over those years. Yeah, I think there's also, there's also an appetite for experiential in a very sort of hungry way at the moment. Um, we're seeing much more marketing spend and client budgets getting pushed towards live events and much more tactile experiences. So in a way, um, there's a much brighter light shining on agencies such as ours um, and the sector itself is, is buoyant. It's changing in how brands are um, using those moments to tell their stories, but it's certainly an exciting time to be in this sort of quite niche part of the design industry. Mm. I remember going back 11 years, um, I, I was working uh, at the time in the advertising industry in print, in print media. And when the sort of the big financial crash hit in 2008, you know, there was a, a huge shift in advertising spend and how companies were approaching marketing budgets and, and, and promoting their brands. Um, certainly print suffered as a result of that. But um, was that a sort of period of time that for you guys, you saw companies really start to rethink how they were pushing their brands and what exactly and how they defined marketing? I, I don't think so. I mean, for us, we've, as an agency, we've, uh, our growth um, has been gradual and, you know, almost growing, let's say, one, two percent per year, every year since, since starting. So we might have bucked the trend a little bit. There's been big years and, and down years within that sort of quarter century mm. um, it's funny you talk about print we're working at the moment on a huge huge print project um, and it's quite a hot topic here at the moment in the in the studio about how print went from being the method of communication to just being a method you know not yeah. a bad one um, and it's certainly um, it feels like live events have had the same kind of um, kind of up and down in how they're perceived as in value terms and it's value we take more seriously than perhaps other agencies i think it's about putting there's a there's a tendency to deliver live events um, and feel good about the moment and how it looked and how it felt and actually if you focus on the results and you keep looking at how the performance of these events um, yeah. has perhaps changed over the years we're in a an interesting moment in time where we're able to measure things a lot more than perhaps we could 10 or 11 years ago. And we're being asked 
questions about value. So I think if you put the question back in those terms, you yeah, probably get a better print, answer. Exactly, and print is one of those tools that we use, and we still do, and for the right thing, for the right time. Mm. That's absolutely what we do. The moving over to the word digital became you know, a real fundamental change and, and yeah. a flexion point completely in, in the industry. But now digital to us is, is an essential part of the, of the delivery and of the message delivery. It's, it's become form forming part of every solution that we do but mm -hmm. there's always print and there's always um printed branded giveaways and merchandise so they all still exist they don't go away uh, they're all part of the visitor experience sure one thing that captured me when i was looking at your um your website and doing a bit of prep ahead of today's episode um was a sentence uh on the website and in, in some of your material that says we value the influence we create not just the things we make and um i think that perhaps andy ties into what you were saying about um about you know I I events you know not necessarily just being sort of one-off you know uh individual things you know you guys are on about creating influences long term beyond the actual event itself aren't you yeah, I mean, it, it's all about defining what impact you want and how you're going to measure that influence. But certainly here we really practice kind of objective driven creativity. We try to um, push that through our studio teams. We try to push that conversation through with our clients and try and make sure that we're all working to a common goal and that there is a measurable goal somewhere, you know, throughout the life of the event. It might be day one, it might be six months down the line in a sort of pipeline sales. And um, whatever it is, it, it, it isn't the look of it and it isn't the aesthetics. Sure, every part of the um, creative execution um, forces an opinion, but if it's not measurable and it's not targeted and focused on a specific goal, then we're kind of less interested in it, I think. Yeah, we talk about, we, get, we win the odd awards that we don't even know about, but they're more pageantry awards and kind of stuff that looks, you know, this is a stand that looks good. Those aren't of interest to us, to be honest. Um, that sounds maybe a little bit arrogant, but but we're interested in the, the effectiveness of awards. We really care about how effective our solutions are and not what they actually look like. And that, of course, does come down, back down to goals and objectives. And they're so different. We, the thing we found fascinating over 25 years, and I think the things that people would find surprising is how varied they are um, when our, our clients are going to different shows, but they've got the same, they they might feel like they've got the same objectives as every other, every other client. Actually, they're wildly different and they can vary massively, which is, should influence and drive creative. That's, that's what we care about. Yeah, sure. It's a good, um, you know, over those 25 years, it's a good example of something that has changed massively, you know, the way to measure. And I think if you went back perhaps nine, 10 years ago, when a social sort of transactions were becoming a really hot, tool and it was about likes and shares mm -hmm. and i think from my perspective it was like we're past that now and great if you can deliver an event that gets social reach but it's not enough really you know you can manufacture likes you can have people sharing things and in a not so positive way and we certainly went through a period of that was the goal of every brief was to get a million likes or hit this <laughs> through social and absolutely it's part of the picture but it's I guess it's a response to live events are very momentary. They're very um, short lived and we crave transactional results because they're easy to put a fact to how many feet from walk through the door, you know, eyes on content, clicks and likes and shares, even sales, but it's other kind of emotional responses to things and yeah. the emotional impact that, that's tough to measure and always has been. And I think, you know, will continue to be tough. Yeah. This is an interesting observation for us that, um, trade shows, exhibitions, events, they are difficult to qualify. They're difficult to see the, the, the exposure and the impact that they have compared to a new packaging design or, or how effective they are. So it's difficult to do that. But we're, we're bringing technology now that allows us to monitor really quite quite measurable results of what yeah. to AI results of what sort of people are coming in, how what they're interested in, how long they're, they're staying, dwell time on certain areas of the, of the solution. So it's quite a... A quite interesting time, really, where technology is sure. helping to define to, to, to find solutions, but also how they're being taken taken on by visitors. Do, do, do the types of target that you set or work on with clients to define influence change depending on whether it's B to B or B to C? Because there have always been those sort of two distinct strands of, of of communication, haven't there, for businesses? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it goes deeper than that. Um, you know. Sometimes, or more often than not, it depends on the, the brief. So we will work with, for example, uh, 
clown at the bars canon and a consumer show but really it's about launching a product so for them it's about trials mm-hmm. you know, we're quite keen to make sure that b2b or b2c are always focused around people and that the right. user is the is the sort of beating heart of the event so rather than a separation of of how we would measure it, it comes down to whether it's a product launch or a um, brand exposure exercise and that can be you can have very different metrics that you're collecting from a consumer show that's trying to launch a product to a b2b show i mean it it really does range quite yeah, significantly no, for us. We, we like the fact that those lines are blurring, actually, and we, we've always felt that that's a B2B show is traditionally seen as a little bit more of a commercial, slightly duller kind of thing. It's a bit more business-based. Well, we kind of feel that shouldn't be the case, and actually our clients aren't, aren't, don't reflect that opinion now. They, they want us just to have fun and experience things that are, that are doing, you know, really enjoying the, the experience and not no longer is it kind of a, yeah, it, kind of, um... it's interesting you say that because because just just recently on the podcast we were talking to somebody about this very thing about how B two B you know traditional trade shows and things that you might have seen as quite stuffy you know men in suits walking up and down and with briefcases and collecting flyers in in plastic bags you know the the landscape has shifted dramatically hasn't it people uh, visitors is what's driving it, for, it, it with the, with the discussion I was having that they demand. A better quality event regardless of whether it's consumer or business yeah our expectations are high now in, in brand experience we don't want to look at things you know and be told things we want to make our own mind up if we believe yeah. the story to be true or not engaged, yeah. and you know retail's changed and our expectations of digital have changed and it, it's really forced actually some of the old-fashioned legacy sort of trade shows the b2b stuff that that can't keep up those a lot of those events have, have died off you know things yeah. like seabit and Basel world these kind of huge great big b2b events that haven't moved with the time and there's this sort of end of uh, trend of festivalization and making events more personalized towards what people might want and my experience at a show will be different to dan's because the show can respond to me in a way that it can't respond to dan and based on what value i exchange and what input i give i get something better out of it and i think you know we're seeing a lot of um, older, perhaps classic events struggling with that mm-hmm. fast pace. Um, and it, you're right, it's all driven by user experience and expectation. And it's and it's a, it's about making these these events effective. And uh, which brings me on to something that I wanted to ask you today. And it's it's I don't know if you would call it a mantra of yours, but something that um, appears regularly again in in literature and on your website is this phrase "effective experiential." Um, and and I was I was curious to ask today, um, uh, you know, w- what exactly does that mean? Is it just a buzz phrase, or is it uh, something that is genuinely important to you? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a it's a clear statement of what we do. It, and there's a lot of what I would consider um, substandard brand experience work out there. Um, there are a lot of um, ad agencies delivering events, at stations that are about, you know, going beyond trials, but trying to push brands out in really kind of stunt PR sort of mm. ways. And the goals, they're just, they're not very meaningful to me. You know, there's a lot of shit out there that I'm, I'm not particularly excited about in brand experience and yeah. um, I think for us effective experiential is just a way of qualifying what we consider to be good experience work you know has to do some serious impact in the kind of effect yeah. yeah yeah it really does underline kind of our, our, our philosophy as well it's it's always been there right from day one it's always been since the start of 2LK um, 25 years ago it's always been in that idea that, that we let's not get carried away with the look of something let's let's make sure it's driving business and return on in that massive investment because we more than anyone else i think we understand what costs are involved in this and we really want to make those those goals happen uh, and make sure they're not just something that we're designing for because someone has a, a particular view on it our, our dba you know we're really pleased with our dba awards that we've won design mm-hmm. effects awards awards it for intel and canon and they really do kind of shine out and we're very proud of them um for that reason so it, it underlines those and those awards that we care about hmm. uh, something you mentioned earlier on uh, at the start of the episode um dan was, was 
looking at the 25 year history of the company and how things have developed and shifted and and you mentioned briefly as as, as technology has developed um you know it, it offers new facets of opportunity to you as a business um and and technology is something that we talk about regularly on on the podcast for for, for obvious reasons but um you know it, it, from a creative point of view andy as a, as a creative director um does does the technology that has come to the fore over the last decade or so really help you from a, a creative point of view or is it more from an analytical point of view when you're looking at, at monitoring the influence that you've had on a particular event yeah it's um it's a good question actually i think for us technology um has had a big impact on the agency so we're much more integrated now i guess what started 25 years ago as a consultancy that would fundamentally put uh, an architectural framework around a brand and help mm -hmm. to host the st storytelling and the product launches. We now have digital content and um, interactive media, all forms of tech responses to briefs. Uh, all of that specialist skill set is within our agency sort of studio at the moment. So on the one hand, it's helped to us to create much more integrated solutions for our clients. But we're also a huge believer that there's a lot of tech for tech's sake out there and um, there's a lot of we're often asked by clients or potential clients to put things in that are a kind of keeping up with the joneses sort of request hey everyone's doing x so we'd like to do it and you know we're huge advocates for simplicity across all of our work and um, tends to be if we can simplify the process for a client if we can simplify the experience for a visitor if we can simplify a message so that it's understandable and memorable then we're doing something right and technology should simplify things and create a much uh, easier intuitive more gratifying experience and at the point where it becomes a barrier or a complication or an obstacle yeah. it, it, it's gone and it's out of the scheme entirely yeah and i think the reason why some of our long standing clients Intel we've been working with for 25 years actually as long as we've been going 24 I think um, HSBC for the 15 years and it's been some of those because we're challenging those kind of connotations of we must have this we must have a, a touchy thing on our stand <laughs> have one. and we go no why you know what's the reason for it there we care passionate about it and I think that care can sometimes be a bit prickly to be honest in a, in a client agency relationship where we're challenging that and saying what's the reason for it being there and but we care about it and, and i think that really comes through and why we've been successful and not always saying yes yeah we have to say this what's the reason for that technology yeah to work better for you or is it the right technology could we look at a different way to communicate that and, and it sort of ties in a little bit if, if i'm getting the message right andy of, of what you said there's there's tech for tech's sake and there's also design for design's sake isn't there you know that they might want a bank of ipads there for people to go and use just simply because well we think it looks nice and it fills up that space you know but if it's not going to actually bring any value to the content that they're trying to impart on visitors or delegates or wherever it may be then you have to have the courage to be able to say to a client i don't think this is going to work and it's of no value to you yeah, exactly. I think the way we operate as a business is we challenge everything, we try to simplify everything, and we try to measure everything. And any brief that is requesting specific tech without very good reason, i.e. you, the client, made that tech, you know, yeah. got a specific reason to use it, will get challenged. Yeah. And, you know, it's not a point blank refusal, it's just to try and understanding of where that desire has come from. And normally there's a problem behind the problem, which is what we're really trying to solve. So that kind of challenger mentality helps us to dig out the real brief. Mm. And, and, you know, it's, we have delivered over the last few years some of the most tech sort of integrated and complex technology solutions out there, but always at the root of it will be a solid idea that ha actually extends the understanding of the brand or extends the experience in some way and always simplifies it. So it's a really nice mix I think we've got here of, understanding embracing and doing some really powerful pioneering technology experiences and also being one of the most vocal agencies out there to say no to and, I, and the other thing is it makes a difference to us we want to be working on projects that we enjoy working on it, mm -hmm. we care a lot about our the culture of the agency we care about working on great work and with great clients that appreciate and creative but they appreciate us and appreciate the design community and it's, it's really important for us and it, i think it helps right across that transparency when we're working on we talk about this other kind of phrase about knowing our superpowers and also knowing weaknesses and whilst yeah. we have skills in-house we also really care about collaboration with other agencies so we do a lot of work and bringing other agencies 
uh, to work with us on things and, and kind of it just keeps things really fresh and it's, you can't do it all yourself and I think we're, we're a company of, of uh, 26 people, 28 now, <laughs> I, lose, I lose track sometimes um, and we know we, sometimes it's really interesting getting other agencies involved and acting as a lead agency and, and working with a client that way. It's a great way to keep things moving on. And, and it's, it's, it's interesting because as I think about it, there's the old uh, paradox, you know, if you want peace, you must prepare for war. And I guess if you guys are going to have the courage to be able to stand in front of clients and say, this is going to be great, but we don't think actually you should do this. Do you have to invest a lot of time as a company in actually staying up to speed with the latest text, staying up to speed with latest developments, investing your own time in actually learning how they work and what they can do? which could ultimately lead to saying, actually, no, that's going to be of no value to us. Yeah, I think it's one of the really fascinating things about this sector, particularly for us. We've got some very, very brave clients. Um, a lot of our work is in the tech sector, and we just naturally find ourselves at cutting-edge technology events where we're delivering something for somebody, but we happen to be at the launch of something that somebody else is doing. But we're right. very, very exposed to it through the kind, kind of client base that we've got. Mm. And we've got a very curious set of minds here and we seek this stuff out and but it's also you know technology evolves much quicker than people do and our understanding of it so having that kind of understanding is one thing and having that kind of um slight hesitance to deploy is another sure yeah yeah, yeah and i think to add to that really the, the tech industry we really do work in we, we do work in other industries but actually to talk about the tech industry for a moment is so fast moving it kind of ties in with the way we are a little bit we're, we're very sort of move things quickly and in we're quite agile in the way we run our business and that really works and ties in nicely with the tech business and i, I enjoy the the industry we work in because things move so quickly and we're used to doing things very last minute technology changes that way announcements aren't made on technology six months before they're made days weeks before um such a launch so we we prepare for that and we enjoy working with that kind of crazy industry of tech. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. When, when, you're, when you're working with clients, and I suppose when you're working with, it could be an existing client, it could be a brand new client coming to you. Ultimately, uh, the, the process will start, I presume, with a, with a briefing, with an idea from the client as to what they might want, um, and then hand that over to you to either deliver or, or become creative with that initial idea. Um, how do those briefings that you receive vary? Are they, are they generally pretty good or you know, could, could brands come to you with a better idea of what they want in the first instance to allow you to deliver it more accurately? Depends who's, uh, who's signed up to listen to the podcast. Um, <laughs> the full suite, yeah. The full suite, you, you get some very thought out, very very good briefs that come in that really, you know, we look and go, wonderful, this, is, this tells us exactly what we, what we need and, and it gives everyone something excited to jump onto. Others are need a few more questions. Shall we yeah, say? I think so. Last week, uh, we kicked off a really interesting project. It's a pitch, and um, I won't say who it's for, but rather than a brief, which of course there was a written document, you know, this client uh went to the trouble of hosting long briefing sessions. You know, we I took six guys from the studio out to Germany and we spent time with the various stakeholders of this project, really, really understanding and giving us a chance to interrogate them and find the problem behind the problem. And that's unfortunately rare. And it really shines through as one of those, you know, once a quarter sort of opportunities. Mm. One thing I would say is uh, we, we turn down a lot of work, actually. Um, I guess whether we talk about the, um, the pitch, free pitch kind of paradox today or not, it's different. But typically for us, we get invited into a lot of tenders and, you know, the quality of the brief will be one of the first red flags for us is as to whether we proceed or not. And this saying of kind of shit in, shit out. Yes. Yeah. And if we are expected to move mountains and create incredible results out of something that's frankly not been thought out very well and not had effort put into it, you know, it's the first thing that we'll look, look for when we're qualifying potential work and potential clients. Sure. Well, would you consider yourselves in, in, 
the, the, in, among your peers and among other agencies that are working in, in the sector, would you consider yourselves to be a, a, a small operation, a medium operation, you know, a, a, and, and if you are, how, how does that put you on a playing field with, you know, bigger agencies that are out there working with, you know, if people go to your website, they'll see the types of brands that you're working with. We're talking serious global brands here uh, for an agency that is how big? Yeah, we're, we're just sort of knocking on 30 staff. We've, we've constantly got a stream of kind of long-term contract support here. So, you know, we're a sort of 30 strong business. Uh, we've just opened up a small office in California, which has been running for about 18 months. Um, for us, it's, it's about, it's a mindset, you know, there's this kind of small giants philosophy here, which is we do great work. We do it for, great brave businesses and we don't really worry about whether there are bigger agencies who do it mm. better you know fundamentally uh, there's a there's a whatever project we've delivered things from you know 100 pounds up to three million pounds or, or bigger and the team never really extends beyond a sort of group of 10 i think so you might have 100 or 200 people within your agency but you can end up, end up duplicating a lot of skills and having 10 fantastic talented skilled experienced people you can turn around work that can compete with anybody you know as long as you've got all of the core elements there and and, and we rely heavily on a, a partner agencies and a network of suppliers to help us execute you know what we create I, I was just going to say as well that just to add to that I, I guess if you have if you possess such strong core values of what you want to achieve which is what comes across in talking to both of you that if you become an agency of 500 staff, suddenly that, that core value and those core messages and mantras suddenly become diluted a little bit, or there's a risk of them becoming diluted, isn't there? With a, with a small core team, it's easier to adhere to those values. It is, and, and you know, let's not forget, I mean, Addy and I started, um, the, the story here is, is quite interesting, really. We both started in the business um, different times, but as juniors or, or designers. So we're both creative, um, and that kind of shows through. We still want to be involved in these projects and us owning the business um, the way we do allows us to be really agile and make those decisions quite quickly, uh, instantly actually, and it needs that. But it also gives us the advantage of being involved in our clients and talking to them directly. And we're talking to our clients day in, day out. It's not, we're not kind of faceless business owners that, that they don't see. We, we enjoy that. We enjoy talking to our clients and understanding their needs and those objectives we, we talked about. And so it's a really... It's a really nice kind of, I think, size of the business works with those. And I also don't think you need a business of five, six hundred to service the kind of brands we're talking about. Actually, the needs that they have are quite controllable. And we spend a lot of time saying, you don't need this, you don't need that. We're going to do this really lean for you. And, you know, we're, we're in an office here in, in Farnham, in Surrey, um, out of London. And we enjoy yeah. that too. We don't, we don't have a sort of real desire to be to be up there and, and it's a really nice friendly family friendly kind of business for that reason right? yeah i think it comes back to that idea of simplifying things and yeah we we try to simplify the work down to a point where it's we're working smart you know and the scale and the volume that we've got here of, of talent doesn't prohibit us from entering or winning or delivering anything out there yeah. and in in many ways it helps us focus to make sure that we're picking up the best bits of work and the bits that we care about the most and that are the most rewarding. And um, it's certainly, I think your original question there is about kind of culture and how culture scales. And it's, sure. it's a yeah. really interesting and difficult thing. I guess for us, our scaling up has always been um, organic and gradual and controlled and, and culture can grow along and improve and you know all the rest of it as as the volume grows it's when businesses um surge you know they double immediately and you lose uh contact in a very abrupt way uh, so. and it sounds like your approach to business is very much the same as your approach to actually the work that you do with your clients and what you've said which is that unless there's value in it you have to look very very carefully at whether or not it's actually worth it is it expansion for expansion's sake is it new members for new members sake or is it actually going to bring genuine value to what you're looking to achieve yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we approach every project with the, with the same mindset and some of those, um, the work that comes to us and we say no to can often be because actually we don't think we can add anything to this. It's not a, a creative solution enough. It's, you don't need us, you mm. need somebody else and that's fine. You know, we, we, we've got very used to saying that and don't take the work on 
uh, you know, we always say don't chase the turnover, um, chase the, the type of work we're, we're looking at. And I think that's really held fast right from the early days of a tour mm. play, I think, as the, the sort of guy before us with it. Yeah, sure. We're coming towards the end of time on, on today's podcast, but, but uh, before we wrap things up, guys, um, uh, curious to know whether or not you can tell us any more about um, the Cannes Lions uh, Festival of Creativity. Um, I'm, I'm told it's just around the corner. Um, what's your involvement in it? And tell us a bit, little bit more about it, if you can. Yeah, I mean, for us, working with the organisers of Cannes Lions has been a real privilege, actually. We've been working together for about five or six years and actually had a really nice hand in shaping how that festival works. And it's a good example of um, uh, taking our work kind of off the trade show floor mm -hmm. um, and working down in Cannes on sponsored pavilions, beach clubs, yachts, hotel suites, but also massive parts of the festival um, sub events, you know, the entire um, auditoriums and visitor experiences around the content tracks that they're delivering year on year. It's been fantastic. Um, and it's, it's kind of the beating heart of the creative industry. And it's also, it's a place where um, advertising is celebrated. It's a place where effectiveness is celebrated and it's becoming a place where live events and experiences are celebrated. And, and it's really nice to feel like we're in the middle of it and we're helping to shape that experience. Um, and it's a great example of a client who helps us understand the latest trends and technology and to be connected to, you know, the Olympics of creativity in such a, um, rich way is, is really powerful it's, yeah. fantastic. it's a busy busy time this week next week our guys are already out there um sort of dr drilling things into beaches and things so uh, <laughs> we're here trying to kind of look at all the deliveries coming in and yeah it's a really exciting time now we send our designers out there um just to see the event as well though i'd certainly advise any uh, agencies out there to send the staff down there and just understand what it's all about it's a great event to be yeah. part of and what a feather in the cap for you guys that given the very nature of what that event represents and, and the people who are visiting there um, and the people who are participating in it, that, that you guys are delivering those sort of uh, services for the organisers themselves at that type of event. Um, congratulations to you for your involvement with it. It's uh, very much deserved. We've been talking on the podcast today to Dan Mason and Andy Sexton from 2LK, uh, just reflecting, I suppose, if you can call it that, on, on 25 years in the business, how things have changed, what their ethos is, some of their mantras and how they approach the work that they do. Effective experiential is the key phrase to come out of this. And uh, head over to their website, find out a little bit more about them. If anybody wants to uh, get in touch with you guys, what's the best way that they can do that? That's a good question. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Probably just jump on our website and, and uh, let us know. We've got Twitter feeds and uh, Instagram and stuff. Search us up to OK. There's not many uh, named that. So have a look for us. Um, we'll certainly be dropping some, um, some uh, social stuff around Can over the next week. So you'll see a little bit more of us. Fantastic. Guys, thanks very much for joining us. If you're watching the video of today's podcast on eventindustrynews.com, head over to Podbean or iTunes or any other podcast downloader and uh, you can access all of the previous podcasts as audio versions. Great to listen to on your commute to and from work if you're out and about. Uh, if you're listening to today's podcast, go the other way. Head over to eventindustrynews.com. You can see videos of all the podcasts and check out some of the latest features and stories on Event Industry News while you're there. It brings us nicely to the end of today's episode. Our thanks once again to Dan Mason and Andy Sexton from 2LK. My name's James Dixon and we'll see you on the next episode of the Event Industry News podcast. Thanks very much. See you soon. Thank you, James. Bye. -bye.